Welcome in. In this video, I'm going to be telling you my top 10 games that I played for the first time over this last year. Now, not every game on the list actually came out last year. Some of them came out maybe the year before that and just kind of started getting circulated around the US over the last year. And then some of them are even older than that. These are the games that are new to me. So a couple of these are classic, maybe older games that I just came around to and played for the first time over the last year. Before I tell you my number 10, I do have one game that is an honorable mention for the day, and that is The Crew number two, The Crew Mission Deep Sea. And the reason it's an honorable mention is because it's basically the same game as The Crew. It's like a reworking of The Crew. I love The Crew. It's one of my favorite games. So it would sort of be like an automatic number one for the year. Awesome, awesome trick-taking game, an amazing twist on trick-taking that makes it cooperative. The Crew, Mission Deep Sea, the second one, is also a great game because it's basically the same game. Our number 10 is our newest game on the list, and that is Expeditions, a sequel to Scythe. And the reason this is number 10 is because it's the most recent game that I've played. I've only had it for a handful of weeks. I haven't got to play that many times, so I didn't really feel comfortable playing it higher than that. Basically, you have a big world you're kind of exploring. You're going around from like spot to spot and taking actions on those spots. You're playing cards from your hand. You're trying to acquire more cards. You're always trying to balance out like the cards you have. You want to have them because when you play them, they do cool stuff. But also you can use those cards and the cards actually themselves will have things like quests or items or meteorites, things that basically make your, your character, your mech better. And the other cool thing is how you take your actions. You always have to cover up one of those three things. So you're going to have a turn where you have gather covered up so you're going to move and you're going to play a card from your hand but the next turn you can't keep gather covered up you're going to cover up something else maybe you cover up move so you play a card and you gather well the next turn maybe you really want to play another card and you want to move so you go back and you slide and you cover up gather but basically how you plan out your route through the board of okay every turn you're going to have to have one of your three things, but never the same thing twice in a row covered up. So how are you going to do that? It's actually, if you know Scythe, it's similar to when Scythe is, you know, you can't take the same action twice. You're always like, yeah, this is what I want to do most, but should I do this first before I take this action? So kind of planning out your route through the board is really interesting. Our number nine game is Flamecraft. So Flamecraft basically makes onto the list because it's really cute. It's really good looking, but also pretty fun to play. Like you're just going around gathering resources, then using those resources to enchant spots. You want to play place dragons, get more dragons, but the way the resource collection is interesting and the game's not super complicated. Don't jump into Flamecraft expecting like a medium heavy game. It's on the you know, light to medium side of things, but the way your actions are pretty cool. Like you can be playing dragons and when you play a dragon into a shop, you get like some rewards. So you want to play a dragon. So you put a dragon down, you get a reward. Maybe you get a draw a dragon or maybe you get end game score a dragon or maybe you get a coin which can be a wild for something but then also by putting that dragon down you have made that shot more powerful so you or any other player that goes the rest of the game can get like more resources from that spot so what ends up happening is we start to game out you're like, okay we're going to go to this spot here and get two iron but later in the game you go to that same spot and there could be like three iron on the top also an iron dragon and a meat dragon and a bread dragon all from that same spot and then those dragons all have special abilities that can give you even more resources Sources. Our number eight is a game that was so popular and has stayed so popular since this came out. It feels like it's pretty old, even though it's not that old yet. And that is Cascadia. Cascadia is great because one of these games that you can literally teach in like five minutes. All you're going to be doing is you're going to be taking tiles in your turn. When you take a tile, there is an animal token matched up with that. You're going to place that tile somewhere in your little, your little grid in front of you and then place the animal on that tile or another one of the tiles already out there. You're going to get points at the end of the game depending on how well you kept landforms together. Like if you keep a lot of forest tiles kind of together in big groups, you'll get points, but also in like the pattern and the way you place those animal tokens. The two really cool things about Cascadia is number one, it is super light and simple like i said it's literally a game you can just teach and within like probably five minutes have the game up and running just hey take a tile take an animal token place it on your little you start out just three little tiles like a little tiny triangle you place it on the other big appeal is the strategy it's actually fun what you're going to do is there's like five different animal types and there's cards for each one of those but the cards aren't the same every round you can pick out how you want those cards to score so for example you can say i want bears to score in like i think it's called mama and cub so you have like any group of three bears you want to place your not your tiles but when you place the animal tokens you're trying to get three bears 
touching each other. You don't want any other bears to touch because bears are territorial. Maybe they'll eat the other bears or something. So you want groups of three. Every group of three gives you so many points. As you're kind of laying out your tiles of the potential tokens that can go on there, you want to keep groups of three bears maybe together. And then in case I didn't make it clear, basically each animal comes with four cards. So you have a bear card, but there are four options for the bear. So you could choose which bear card you want to play with this round, which will make the bears behave slightly differently than, you know, the next round you keep that same bear card, but switch out the hawk card to a more complicated hawk card if you want to go for something like that. At number seven, I have the beautiful, beautiful game, Earth. I mean, it just looks absolutely amazing when it's set up. I mentioned in my review of the game, one of the big appeals to me is that it looks great and it's beautiful. Everdell looks great and beautiful as well. Everdell is a beautiful game. However, what Earth does that's so cool is it's very real as well. So there's a group of people it's going to really appeal to because they want like real things. It's actually nice photographs of the planet Earth, which is kind of a cool twist, right? There are games that have beautiful artwork of like space ideas. Actually, there's not a lot, but they could. Or beautiful artwork of like, you know, woodland creatures or something that have baskets and they're picking berries, you know, Everdell style, like that kind of cute art. But Earth just looks great, but it also is a very real kind of lived in feeling game. But of course, looks alone will not land you on this list. The gameplay actually has to be good. And for Earth, it is. So Earth kind of does something unique that I really like. I want every game in the world to do this, but I like that this game exists for this reason. You can play with a group of four people. When every time you take an action on your turn, everyone else takes that same action to a lesser degree. So on your turn, you get a lot done. But let's say you, you spent all your resources. You can't do anything else on your turn. Well, on your next three turns, when it's not your turn, you're going to get small payouts. So there's going to be little things you can do when it's not your turn, which really keeps the game moving as you get to the higher player counts. Not really going to slow down because every time I'm doing something, everyone else is doing something too. There is the drawback. The reason I wouldn't want every game to do that is because there's the drawback of not everyone's just focused on everyone else's turn, right? You're all a little bit doing your own thing. Like, what action? You want the red action? Cool. I think it's actually like burn doors, but you want that action? Cool. We'll all do that action. When everyone kind of looks at on board, then I'll kind of look up. Okay, it's so your turn now. What action are we doing? Okay, we're all doing green. Cool. We all do green. So I wouldn't want every game in the world to do this. However, it's a really unique experience and gives you the ability to play a medium weight game, not like medium heavy, but just like medium, medium complexity game that doesn't have to balloon out to like, oh, it's four players. So it's going to be two and two and a half hours long. It kind of keeps the play length just a little smaller because again, you're always getting so much done even when it's not your turn. Our number six is actually one of the oldest games on the list. It's actually already 10 years old, which 10 years is not an old game. There's lots of games I like from 10 years ago, but for games that are new to me, that means it's a game that's been around, but I just played for the first time last year. And this is a game that I feel like I had heard about on and off and I just knew I would like it. I'm like, whenever I play that game, I know I'm going to like it. It's really ugly. It's, it's, it's an ugly looking Euro, but it just sort of sounds like it just calls to me. It's called, we would say Orleans, I guess in America, but it's Orleans, it's French. It's a uh, Orleans. It's a great game. The reason I said it just sticks out to me as a game that I figured I would like and I did is it has bag building. So you've heard of deck building probably. You you have cards. You spend those cards. Or the game, you buy new cards. We're actually going to have a deck builder here in just a second. And the new cards you have are more powerful. You're going to spend those cards and you're going to buy more cards of some way. So that's what deck building is. This is bag building. You're going to have a bag. You're going to pull little guys out of them. They're going to be things like knights or monks or farmers. You can take certain actions with those, with those tokens, but throughout the game, you're going to be acquiring new tokens to put into your bag on your turn. When you pick out from the bag, you start like tailoring your hand to like, I want more knights or I want more monks or scholars or farmers or merchants, whatever you want. You can start kind of tailoring your, not your hand of cards, but your bag of tokens. So when you pull things out, you get more and more of what you want. You can go for, do I want a lot of them, a little of them. They're just like deck building where there's a way to get rid of cards out of your hand. It is boring looking. It's actually maybe on the side of even it's ugly. It's definitely ugly looking. The front cover is definitely ugly. It doesn't look ugly when you set it up. But the front cover is pretty the But it's just a fun game where you're like, cool, I'm just going to pull this out. What do I have? I pulled out these five tokens or these six tokens. What can I spend? What actions can I activate? Because lots of actions are going to be like, you need a merchant and a knight and a farmer for this action. Or you need this and this, different combinations. You're always trying to figure out ways of like, you know, getting what you want out of the tokens you drew. Our next game is one that if you follow board games, you probably have heard way too much over the last year. However, it is a really fun game and it's again, sort of kind of my style game. So it has to be here. Arc Nova is our number five. Arc Nova is great. Basically you are in charge of a zoo and you're going to be doing zoo things, but 
in contrast to a game earlier like Cascadia, I love Cascadia, it's really fun. But basically what's fun about Cascadia is it takes a game and trims it down to like it's bare bones. You're gonna take a tile that comes to the animal token, you're gonna place and place it somewhere, right? Arc Nova is the other approach. It's like, how many zoo-like things can we have you do and make the game good. So you're not just like, I'm gonna place this animal into my zoo, but you're like, oh, you don't have an enclosure for that animal yet. This this animal needs a specific type of enclosure, or this needs to go into like the reptile house. So you're building out your zoo landscape actually on a map and also placing animals into those spots. But you're also like trying to deal with like making deals with other countries and stuff to like get animals from there, have benefits from then. There's like there's there's like a board over here and there's tracks on the main board of how you draft animals and it's it's there's like not just victory points, but there's victory points and uh oh no, I'm drawing a blank. I want to say it's called reputation, but it's not important right now. Basically, there's two different scoring tracks and you want to do really well in both of them. You can't have one lag too far behind the other immensely complicated game you could play a two-player game of this and it could take a, a few hours but it's all fun if you're into that heavy game i am i love big complicated games like that so just kind of like another great great game that had to be here actually i think it would be higher on my list like some of you are thinking arc nova's only number five from this last year. The only reason it's not higher is because I, I don't get to play it a lot because it's so big. Anyways, all that aside, let's go on to our next game and that is Summer Camp. The thing I love about this game is it like takes deck building and boils it down to like its simplest form. In fact, you could almost say a little too simple. However, that's what's appealing to me about this game is that you can teach people who haven't played deck builders before, haven't played a lot of board games before, and it's not a whole bunch of overhead like, yeah, there's this and there's this timing problem and there's this. And yes, there are a few cards that we're used to as like deck building fans that aren't in the game. Things are trying to keep their complexity low. But again, what I like about it is it's sort of a game anyone can play. I played with kids and kids just love it because it's really simple. Also, the theme is super fun. You're like in summer camp, you just have three merits, three badges you're trying to earn in summer camp. And the three decks you choose can be different from game to game. You choose from like a, a box of, uh, I think there's seven boxes to choose from. You choose those three out and you can pick which ones you want to do. So you can go for like the games track and you can go for the water sports track. And there's different sets of cards you can buy in each one of those. So like each one has like, I can move two on the water sports, but each track has its own things. Like one track is like the friendship track. And you have a lot of things that you get a bonus but everyone else gets a smaller bonus. But there's also like the games one. If you play with the games track, the games has more like aggressive stuff where you're hurting your opponent. And there's just a lot of other ones too. There's a discovery one that has more like random things you do. So anyways, really fun game. Summer camp, just cute, appealing game. Anyone can learn it pretty quickly. It's a little light if you're like really into deck builders and you love complicated deck builders already you might find a little light for you personally but i find it's a really fun game to teach to people i have a blast playing it because it's just a game anyone can get into pretty quickly we are getting close to the end we are on number three and it is another pretty light game called dorf romantic or dorf romantic dorf romantic am i close the best way to think about dorf romantic if you know nothing about the game is like a cooperative carcass and you're going to be drafting tiles putting them out there. However, when you put a tile out there, sometimes you have goal tiles. Like you need to have a river that's five long. Or you need to have a field that has six fields attached to it, but you're all doing it cooperatively. So you're just taking one turn at a time, drawing and placing a tile. It kind of has the flow of Carcassonne as it goes around the table. The other really fun thing about the game though, is it's extremely modular. It comes with all these different boxes that you're going to unlock as you play the game. And so you play it once and it's like the very basic version of the game. It's another game you could teach in like, two minutes maybe you're just up and running so fast if you were like we love that and if you wanted to play the like campaign style where you play through the whole campaign you unlock things a little at a time or if you were like we love that but cool well here's one new mechanism we can throw in there and the game actually has like if you count all the separate things you can unlock i don't want to give any spoilers but there could be like 15, 25 like different things you can throw in the game. So you can play like the full on game with everything in there. It's like a lot going on, but you can also just like keep it simpler. My personal um, preference is like somewhere in the middle. I don't like all the extra stuff thrown in there, but I kind of like when you have enough extra stuff, there's like a few more decisions in the game. My number two is a game that I feel like I have played for well over a year. It has this weird effect of feeling like it's been around for a couple years. 
I think the reason it wasn't on last year's list is I kind of got the game around the same time I was making the list, which is the nature of these things, right? You have to you have to cut it off eventually, right? That's why I put expeditions on my number 10 spot because I was like, well, I just got it. I want to put it on the list this year because if not, I'll do this list a year from now and be like, what? Why didn't I put on the list last year? But last year, I feel like the cutoff for my number two, I was just not quite comfortable putting it on. I think I had just maybe gotten it. This game is Trekking Through History, which if you watched the channel before, you're probably thinking, yeah, I feel like I saw a video about Trekking Through History a while ago. Yeah, and it's been a while ago. This is kind of like a peek behind the curtain moment. Like sometimes you're making YouTube videos, like you film them, but then you also have to edit them and actually like make a thumbnail and all that stuff and put them out. So they don't always come out in the same order you film them. Like you film a video and then sometimes you like, you know, have something becomes a higher priority. So you want to edit that one first. Not important. The point is that it was on the year one last year. So it's got to be on this year because I think tracking through history is an awesome game. For lots of the same reasons, the last two games have been really fun. It's not that complicated. You can teach it quickly. However, compared to, uh, the last two games, Trekking Through History has a really cool theme. Like you can tell from these the pictures here, it looks great. It's just a beautiful looking game. I think it appeals to a lot of people because the artwork is so good. And they do a good job of being somewhat educational if you want it to be. Like if you see a card and you're like, whoa, I've never heard of that event in history. Trying to like go and visit events in history or time traveler. Then you want to keep your events in order if you can. That's like the gist of the game. But you also see the cards and you're like, oh, I've never heard of that person. Who are Who is that? You can flip the card over and be like, oh, that's cool. And you can read about that person's life or their story if you want to. However, you can also keep the cards flipped over the other way and just totally ignore that. And it's fine for gameplay. You can just like play the game as a game you're trying to like spend time crystals. It has a cool pocket watch thing. I think the coolest mechanism in the game is when you take your turn, you can go to more powerful cards, more powerful, important historical events, get bigger rewards, but your pocket watch moves up more hours and you don't get to go again to all the other players past your pocket watch. So you don't really go around the table in turn order this way. You go around the table basically in turn order of where the pocket watches are. So you'll have these cool moments where you'll go, oh, cool. I want to get this event, which only cost one hour because I'm still going again and get that event, which costs an hour. Then when you get this one, which costs five and I swing away over here and all of you are going to go for where before I take another turn. So really cool game. The timing's interesting. It doesn't end up being that complicated. It's definitely on the lighter to medium side of games, but great looking game, really appealing game for lots of people. And a game that I think is awesome, which is why it's number two. Now I did not intend on starting this list off with so many of the heavy games like Expeditions and Earth and Orleans and Ark Nova, then having three light games in a row, but don't worry. We are ending today on a definitely medium to heavy game called Spirit Island. It's not a game that actually came out, you know, in 2023 or 2022 or 2021. Like it's one that I just got around the plane more recently. In fact, this is a game that I played just around this time last year and I immediately fell in love with it. So this is a game about getting on island. You're going to have cities. The cities are going to become bigger cities. You're going to have troops. You're going to sprout out to new parts of the island. You're going to try to conquer it and take over the natives that live there, except none of that. Like you, you are the people who are defending the island from the evil invaders. So it takes the whole kind of theme and flips it on its head. And it's really fun. The best part about the like fighting part of the game is you're like a spirit of the island, a defender of the island that does cool things to interfere with the combat. But there are people that live on the island, the natives that were already there. And there are the invaders. And you're trying to influence the conflict in favor of the natives. You're trying to defend the island from the invaders. So you're not like, just out there like rolling dice and doing attack on the bad guys or anything like that. But you're playing cards and doing things like, okay, we're going to push a few of the bad guys into this zone because our water spirit can do like a, a waterfall and like do so much damage in this zone. But also like these natives here aren't going to be able to survive the combat this turn. So instead of like doing a battle, maybe one of the people, one of the players can't fight, but he can move the natives out of that zone and save them. Or maybe you can see a zone that you could actually wipe out the bad guys in so you can move them into that zone. So when there is a conflict in the battle there, it turns in your favor. So it's very unique the way the gameplay works. Some of the characters are a little more over fighting characters. Some are more like defense or more just like strategic people placements like that. Some of them are just trying to strike fear into the enemy's heart. So basically make the win conditions easier because they're more afraid of the island in general. One other thing I noticed about the game is that it seems to have a reputation for being extremely complicated. And I will admit it's a lot to read the rule book the first time. So there are a lot of little details. However, it's one of these games that once you get into it and start actually playing turns, it's not as overwhelming as you might think. You're just like, okay, so here's kind of the sequence is really well 
laid out. There are some timing stuff because you have power cards, like when they activate that. Yeah, you'll you'll get wrong when you play, I'm sure, a few times as you kind of get into it. But I think it's totally worth it. It's a game that once you play once or twice, you really just get that flow and that sequence down. It is it is so much fun. So those are my favorite new to me games over this last year. I'd love you to take just a second, go down to the comments, let me know what some of your favorite games are. If you want to take a second and tell me what you love so much about it, that would be awesome because it'd be really helpful to kind of go through the comments that are like, oh, I'm really looking for a game that does this. And they see your game. You say, I love this game because it does this so well. That would just be really awesome. Make the video even more helpful for people who want to discover some really cool new games. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one.